The Bronze Bow, Chapter 19. Please like and subscribe. Before dawn, the boys had found their position. In the darkness, they had followed the shore road south past Magdala, striking inland to a place where the Via Marius, the road the Romans must follow to the coast, wound between steep, almost unscalable banks. There they worked their way painfully upward and hid behind rocky projections to rest. With the first light, they ventured out, only one boy showing himself at a time, to collect the stones that would be their weapons. A very few carried spears and daggers. By the time the sun was fully risen, every boy was well fortified and concealed. Even during the night, there was traveling on this main road to the sea. During the early morning, they counted five large caravans with long files of burdened camels. Families, tradesmen, sometimes small detachment of soldiers passed beneath their hiding place. This had long ago been a dangerous section of road, but now travelers passed with confidence because more than 50 years before, the great King Herod had wiped out the robbers who dwelt in the caves of Arabella, and now a Roman wall flanked the heights. So long had it been since bandits had inhabited this place that now Daniel dared gamble that the Romans would have no suspicion of attack. On the steep cliff below where the boys were stationed, Daniel found the spot best suited for his own purpose. A fissure in the rock extended an oblique line down the face of the rock, wide and deep enough in some parts to hide several men, ending on a narrow shelf barely ten feet above the road. In the crevasse that dipped below the level of the rocky shelf, he posted Nathan and Camille. I'll free Joe and lift him up to you, he told them. You reach down and pull him up. If any soldiers follow, use your spears. Only one can climb up at a time, and I think the second will think twice before he tries. How do you get back? Nathan asked, looking closely at Daniel. When Joel is up, then give me a hand, Daniel answered. He had no real expectation that he would get back up the bank, but he meant to see with the last ounce of his strength that Joel did. Nathan opened his mouth, then closed it, seeing in Daniel's eye a reminder that they had chosen a leader. Through the noonday heat, they waited, their energy draining away bit by bit under the merciless sun. As the hours went by, Daniel's foreboding deepened. This waiting was not the same as the times he had crouched behind a rock, eager for Rasha's signal. It was no flimsily guarded caravan they awaited. And behind him was no tight-knit band that would move with precision and cunning, only a cluster of untried boys. Even now as he glanced up, the flutter of a coat sleeve betrayed one of them. Still, he could count on them. He knew that every boy in the band was prepared to give his life. It was up to him, the one they chose leader, to see that none of them had to. But how different this was from the glorious battle they had hoped for. Would that day ever come when together they could pit their strength against the Romans for God's victory? Daniel put that thought aside. A more immediate worry was the uneasiness that had persisted all night, the feeling that he was followed and watched even in the darkness. Could it be that in setting a trap for the Romans, he had led his band into some other trap? Almost he was tempted to call them back, but there was Joel. At mid-afternoon, Yochtan brought the warning. He alone of all the band was trained to this kind of attack. He wiggled and dodged his way along the roadside and skinned up the cliff into the crevasse. Horsemen, he gasped, about eight, then foot soldiers, then the prisoners. Did you see Joel? No, too far away, but they've come a distance. The horses are lathered. Daniel gave two sharp whistles, the alert they had arranged, and looked up at the bank. Climb up there, will you? He growled to Yokton, pointing. Tell whoever that is to pull in his rump before he gets a javelin in it. That would get Yokton also above the danger line, he reckoned. The first horseman swung into view, moving slowly to keep pace with the footmen. The cavalry rode in pairs, their spurs almost touching in the narrow pass, 
erect, silent, the plumes of their helmets rising and falling with the horse's pace. Would the others remember? The horsemen were to go through. Daniel tensed. He felt a vast relief as not a sound or motion betrayed the boys on the cliff. Behind the horsemen came the foot soldiers in a double line. He watched them pass, one steely face after another. He counted sixteen, then shuffled the prisoners, chained together by the ankles in a long line. Joel was fifth, barefoot, disheveled, his feet dragging. Between him and the rock marched a guard with a heavy whip. Behind the prisoners there would be more foot soldiers. Daniel held his breath. When Joel was nearly below him, he gave the signal. The first rock hurled through the air and found a mark. A foot soldier stumbled. Instantly, the air was flecked with rocks. An order crackled across the line. As one man, the Romans raised their shields above their heads. Four men broke from the rank and charged up the almost vertical rock. A stone caught the first in the chest and sent him reeling back. A spear struck the second cleanly, but the line behind them resealed itself with an unbroken, purposeful unit. Daniel's heart sank. He had guessed wrong. The Romans were going to charge the bank, and the boys could not possibly hold them back for long. But in the same instant as a shout for retreat, a thunder drowned out his own voice. Jerking back his head, Daniel saw with horror the great rock that teetered on the opposite bank, ripped from the cliffside, and crashed down, gathering speed and force, carrying with it a roar of dirt and stones. Stupefied, he watched the leaping, frenzied soldiers. There had been no one on the other bank. What had dislodged the rock? Then he glimpsed a shape, a huge, crouched like an animal, dodging on all fours along the bank. For one flash, he saw the powerful arms, the massive dark head. Samson! But how? Abruptly, he came to his senses. Now was his chance. With a thrust of his arms, he pulled himself up to the shelf of rock and leaped. As his feet found the path, he sank his dagger below the shoulder of a guard, and as the other man crumpled, dropped to his knees before Joel, pulled out his chisel, reached for the chain. The first blow of the sharpened tool left a nick in the iron. He struck again and saw the nick deepen. Confusion swelled around him. The prisoners were screaming now. He heard a second thudding roar, but he did not look up. As he raised his arms for a third blow, he felt himself seized from behind. A paralyzing grip lifted clear off the ground, jerked upward like a helpless sack. For an instant, he hung in the air. Then, he struck against the rock. Pain whirled him in crazy circles, and through the pain, he felt hands clutching and pulling, scraping his flesh along the rock. A heavy body struck squarely on top of him. Legs crashed about his head, and blackness crashed down on him. He came out of the blackness into the blinding sun. There was rock under him, and pain zigzagged through his body. He blinked, trying to focus through the glare. Near him, he made out a figure, Joel, sitting with his knees drawn up, his face buried in his arms. Don't move, a voice warned. Camule's face blocked out the sky. They've about cleared out. Memory came back suddenly. He jerked up and sank back, helpless against the pain. He saw now that he was in a crevasse of the rock, but higher up the bank. Careful, Camille warned. You've got a broken shoulder bone, I think. Maybe a couple of broken ribs. Joel was luckier. He landed on top of you. He's got hardly a scratch. Daniel's hand groped for his head. It was an unfamiliar shape. My irons hit you, Joel said, his voice sounding weak and dull. Good thing, Camille spoke to Joel. How could I have got him up here? Daniel pulled himself up. The soldiers? Gone, but there may be a guard. They didn't come up the bank? No, I think the leader went down with that rock. They never got organized again. The rock? Samson, Daniel cried out, remembering him. I saw him up there. Joel and Camille looked at each other. Daniel tried to shake his mind clear. How did he get up here? We were on the road. Neither boy spoke for a moment. You didn't see? Joel asked finally. Not after they jumped on me. 
Not the soldiers, Joel said. It was Samson. I thought at first it was another slide coming down, and then he was there. He threw you onto the rock right over his head. Then he got hold of my chain and twisted it open with his bare hands. Then he pulled me free and threw me on top of you. Nathan and Camuel pulled us down inside. It was Samson who had lifted him, and Samson who had been following all night, not knowing what they were going to do, but knowing that they could not do it alone. And Samson, the stupid one, who had hidden on the other bank and routed the soldiers. Daniel stared sickly back at Joel. He made himself ask, Where is he? Joel's eyes met him squarely. They took him. He was wounded. A spear hit him even before he had the chain open. He might still... No, said Camille. They dragged him with them. He didn't even fight them. He was... You don't need to worry about the galleys, Daniel. He won't live to reach the coast. Daniel turned his head away. Then he saw Nathan sprawled with his face against the rock. The blood gathered in a blackening pool beneath him. He leaned too far out to pull you down, said Camille. Nathan, whose bride of a few weeks waited in his new house. A sob suddenly twisted in Joel. Why did you do it? He choked. I'd rather you have let me. How many others? Daniel asked. We couldn't see the others. Could you walk? Do you think? We could climb back to where we planned to meet. I can walk, said Daniel. Crawling, wriggling along the crevasse, pulling themselves by fingers and toes, they finally reached the top of the cliff. Daniel lay panting, almost blinded against by pain. When he was able to look about him, he saw the five gray-faced boys lying flat on the cliff's top. During the next endless hour, twelve more slowly wriggled their way to the meeting place. Finally, they were all together, all but Nathan. They lay in hiding till sundown, not talking much. After the darkness fell, four of them went down to the crevasse for Nathan's body. They could not hope to take him home with them, so... They made a grave on the top of the cliff and left him there. Then slowly, wearily, one at a time, they crept down to the road and made their way north like ordinary travelers. They shared a deep thankfulness that Joel was with them, but the might of Rome, seen at close hand, had shaken them. They knew that without Samson they would have failed, and the eager confidence of the night before would never be regained.